Okay, I think it's four o'clock. I think you get started to stay on time. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the seminar. So today we have two speakers, one lightning talk and one um, main speaker. So lightning speaker is uh, Sack Butler. Sack is a PhD student with student group. And we have our second main speaker, Chad Little. And so uh, let's have a Sack. Thank you. <laughs> And if any of you are disappointed, you can't grill me. You can grill me too, because I, 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 thanks. <laughs> okay, everyone. Uh, I've never done a lightning talk. I've never seen a lightning talk. So hopefully, this is a lightning talk. Um, there's no lightning in it, which I did learn today. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is my title has been changing. This is the latest title: um, the relationship between isotope ratios and precipitation and stream flow across watersheds of the National Ecological Observation Network. Okay, so uh, this is NEON. This is the NEON network. It spans all across North America. We are using the 21 red circle stations there. Essentially data is available since 2013 and 2014, going to the present as of 2022. The unique thing about NEON is that it has both aquatic, which is stream flow, and terrestrial, which is precipitation data. We are looking at stable water isotopes, both the hydrogen and the oxygen, looking at precipitation and stream flow. So, our narrative is to address the novelty of NEON stable water isotope data and the capability to understand hydrologic activity on various ecosystems in North America. Three points that you come to main. main Things I'll talk about are the basic patterns between the isotopes in stream flow, Q, precipitation, P, and the relation to the mean water line or the stream water line. Uh, topic two is the relation between the seasonality of the isotope ratios, and that helps us understand how young the water is, which ranges between one to three months old. And then finally, the transit time and distribution or the gamma convolution model. So, how what the average age of the water, not how young it is, but that average um, age in total. So, topic one, um, two sites, one in Massachusetts, the Harvard, one in the Cascades, Washington, just looking at the data, um, precipitation isotopes in red, stream flow isotopes in blue, and their associated lines of best fit. And what this does, and looking at all the other sites, this helps us understand the evaporation and elevation effects to kind of just see what the data has good inputs and good outputs, not necessarily getting into the weeds of it, just looking at the data because no one has looked at it before. Uh, topic two is the relation between the seasonality of that. And so the same sites, uh, the red this time is over a time series over the period of record and taking the amplitude of two sine wave best fits, you can estimate the fraction of young water and that young water is you know, about one to three months old. I'm not focused on the exact age of it, but just that range um, versus like, you, know, you can see 31% of the water based off the two different amplitudes um, at the Harvard site and only 6% at the Wind River site. Uh, and finally, looking at the residence times through a gamma convolution model, we are trying to estimate here in the black line, the stream flow isotopes, which are those red dots. Um, and then kind of what I'll show you focus on here is the average age, the standard deviation, and then two statistical measures. And so, again, these are just two sites, but we're able to estimate throughout the NEON network what the average age of water is with some statistical measures to see how accurate our model is actually doing. Um, I look at all the sites, it's a little overwhelming, but the blue is the range of residence times when we run our model a lot of 100 times, and then the associated range of the KGE. So the higher the KGE, the narrower the KGE, the more confidence we have that that is the actual age of the water at a neon site where, you know, as you get further on this plot, we're not so confident and our model doesn't do a very good job. Uh, any points? So neon data has a lot of potential um, and it, they're continuing to gather the data so we can keep understanding this, keep updating my procedures to understand hydrologic connectivity and like the multitude of research going on at neon, not just isotopes and water, but ecological and environmental research. And this just aids in further understanding of hydrologic systems in long-term research forests. Well, I don't know how long I'm spending. <laughs> <laughs> 
such as the average temperature, precipitation, geology, and soil characteristics, and like whatever else you can think of and that NEON has. And I've looked at like every combination and there is no relationship and kind of wise because like, I mean, a lot of other residence time studies or have like shown relationships to catching characteristics, but like look at what we're dealing with <laughs> from Alaska to Puerto Rico. So it's gonna be pretty hard. I mean, just think like hard to synthesize like a relationship between the characteristics that we're using, um, as well as the gamma models, kind of like it's supposed to adapt to different things within like the inputs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on your little, uh, your, your residence, I mean, thing, it looked like it was a real sine wave thing. And, it, and within a year, you can imagine that you can kind of get them matched up. Yeah. But when it gets to be more than a year, when you go to your next slide, is there a chance that it's that um, it's hard to to estimate uh, uh, residence times greater than a year because they might match up? Like, so if you go to your your, your kind of uh, uh, next one, uh, next that, oh, that one, yes. Yeah, so it all of a sudden it goes like under a year, and then boom, it goes all over the place. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's because this technique works really well for under a year, but but once it gets above a year, then it gets to be kind of uh, uh, indeterminate. Yeah, um, I guess that's a good point. We haven't thought about that too much. Um, we did other different convolution models to try to estimate this and the gamma was by far the best and most accurate for like be able to depict what's going on. Um, and just trying to think of how to answer that still. Um, I guess the way we have it set up is like to use the whole period of records data, obviously. Um, but I guess I can't quite understand how that would line up. If you have big, like if you have yeah. low, low frequency changes of like over a decade, there's real migration in, in yeah. times, then you can do that. But if, if there's really strong annual patterns, then you can just offset by one year and it might say, oh, that's a good match. Yeah. You know, so that, so it depends on if there are some big patterns. Yes. I mean, yeah, that's something I need to think about more. <laughs> when you look at the data, does it, you see the annual patterns, do you see larger patterns? Maybe that, yeah, that's uh, that one. Yeah. No, generally they're pretty, I guess. It's like, of course, there's things I can't mention because it's a lightning talk. But like this, the data that we are using for the precipitation is based off a past student of Steve's who developed this downscaling approach of precipitation isotopes because NEON only has like bi weekly measurements or like monthly measurements sometimes and they're pretty inconsistent. And so this past student developed a downscaling approach to take actual precipitation amounts, your isotope ratios, and essentially you have like a seasonal component that you can see um and then a stochastic component and then like a coefficient component and so you kind of see like these are where we actually have observations and then this is kind of where like we're estimating it you can see it's not as noisy um but it, it allows us to like use our methods to because we need continuous data to to run these models um something else i wasn't like we're not estimating residence times when we don't have both data we're only estimating it when we have Data products. Super. Yeah. Super interesting. Any other questions? After it's all said and done, do you think isotopes are a great way to go? Or how are you feeling? I, I I've never really... used isotopes before the last year. <laughs> I'm a meteorologist, not a hydro now I'm a hydrologist. Um, but yeah, I mean it's pretty interesting the power. That they have. I mean, if you're in the seminar yesterday, I'll be working with Dr. Who at the PNL lab using her water tracer model to essentially predict kind of fractions of young water with what her model can do. And then we'll be working in the Yakima basin with actual isotope data that we're getting from there. Um, 
I mean, it's pretty powerful. There's definitely a lot of uncertainty, but I would never have thought that you could actually like estimate how young. Like, there's like um, Jim Kirshner. He's a hydrologist at some point. <laughs> but we're, this, these are his methods to calculate young water by just taking the two simple sine wave bits and then taking the um, amplitudes of those and then dividing them to estimate this, which is, you know, there's some critics out there, of course, but it's published and other people have used it. So we're kind of doing it too. Yeah. yeah. Is there any elevation effect on uh, precipitation and stream flow? Like precipitation occurs at a higher altitude. Yeah. Assume that. And we are taking water sample from the river and downstream. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, that's kind of what we're like hoping to understand with these kind of plots, like what, how, like how we actually are, how neon is sampling, like whether the precipitation station is a good representation of the stream flow. That was something like that we made sure within like the data is there within our sites is that they were were close to each other within 20 kilometers um, or less than 20 kilometers. But yeah, using these will hopefully see like what sites have strong elevation effects like that one's in the cascade so it you know it might <laughs> this one's in Massachusetts so it's not necessarily in a there's not a lot of mountains there where the station is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. 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 Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get the uh, Zoom link. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to share the screen. Oh, you know. But I guess it's pretty hard to figure it I mean, or I could just present my like, people online. I guess the magic. Uh, they are people, and they are also behind body. Oh, is that it? Oh, good. Can you just sit in? I know. Just click here to join. We know the most of the She's like, oh, oh, there's a guy trying to piece of there we go. Uh oh, I'm going to talk about sprites and anybody know the charges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's try that. Do you have the sound recorder? We could uh, get this one that way. I mean, this stuff here. Let's maybe take a quick look. What is this? Yeah. Yeah. I'm using my mic. Can you hear me now? Great. Okay. And uh, can I get someone online to tell me if they can hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. We're okay. on. We don't have the here. <laughs> oh, here. Let me switch over there. Yay. All right. Cool. So, uh, thank you. You never. 
want to start a presentation off with an apology in advance. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I was informed I was presenting today. So uh, today, and I got about halfway through my materials, but I'm, I'm gonna just wing it. So, hey, I work with uh, John Selker. I'm a assistant professor, senior research at Bioeco Engineering. And I'm here to tell you a bit about a really fun project you've been working on. You might've heard a little bit about it up to now called Weather Chimes. And uh, so I work a couple of positions here. Uh, my hey, Chet. Yes? Are you able to share your screen with us? It's oh, a little hard to see remotely. You don't have it, do you? All right, let me see what I can do about that. Uh-oh, post is disabled screen sharing. <laughs> Let's see. Am I the host? Multiple participants can share. Yeah. Okay. Let's try that. Yay. Can you see me now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. All right. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, my main gig is the uh, Directing the Openly Published Environmental Sensing Lab. And basically, the idea is and you've probably heard about us from John. Uh, if you haven't by now, uh, we work with scientists and researchers studying all kinds of stuff from landslides to um, you know, groundwater stuff and stream water quality and how plants expand and contract when they transferate to get an idea of how they're using their water resources. Um, it's all kinds of things. And the main adventure is that people are um, able to come up with all kinds of ways to design new gizmos with increasing access to open source electronics, uh, tutorials like Hack -a, Hack a Day and Adafruit and Arduino. You might've heard of some of those hobbyist companies that uh, produce those kinds of resources. And so what you can measure, uh, it greatly determines the kinds of research questions that you can ask. And so you can kind of think of the limitations of research is really uh, largely shaped by limitations in observation or instrumentation. And so we work with scientists to come up with new ways to measure things. And uh, a lot of times, you know, like the doctors and professionals can undertake the additional learning curve of becoming experts in electrical engineering, computer science themselves. And so uh, we have a, a massive lab of about how many undergraduate students these days, 30 plus um, from across electrical, mechanical, computer science, bioeco, physics. We had a music major in there at one point. And um, we, uh, yeah, we work with them to design new stuff. And you know, with just a couple of really fun gizmos like laser cutters, 3D printers, and electronic stations, you can do a really great deal of things. And so we're going to hone in on one project uh, called the Weather Chimes. Uh, my other gig, which also really ties into this, is design for social impact. It used to be called Engineering Design for Society. This is a provost initiative uh, funded through Impact Studio. And our mission across colleges, we have partners, or partners from Honors College, Business, uh, College of Liberal Arts, College of Engineering. Uh, we're trying to loop back Cyan, and fingers crossed, maybe someday they'll join the boat as well. Um, and so the main idea is we're trying to produce transcript visible certificates that uh, help undergraduates um, foster more multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary design experience, uh, honed in on serving some kind of social um, uh, current issue. And so, uh, ergo, design for society. So this is a playlist of courses that undergrads can take across all of these partner colleges that focus in on design for society themes and multidisciplinary contexts. Uh, we also facilitate multidisciplinary project-based culminating experiences like Capstone 
that will bring students from across many different disciplines to work on design projects for credit. Um, so weather chimes, uh, you want to focus on like solving some problems. And so, you know, one problem is, is in, in urban environments, people spend 90% of their time indoors. Most of what we know about our Earth is inferred by satellites hovering tens of thousands of miles away from the Earth. Uh, there is no substitute for boots on the ground, in-person observations. However, a really good proxy for that are sensors that are installed on the ground. And what is very useful is having uh, in situ, meaning like in place, um, sensors that can help us validate our satellite data, or you know, there's a paucity of uh, satellite data across many regions that maybe in situ sensors can help us begin to fill in those data sets. So we know that in situ sensing could be really valuable. Uh, also, uh, Internet of Things is the idea that everything that can be connected to the Internet will be connected to the Internet. And so how can this transform environmental science, data science? How can we take advantage of uh, those capabilities? Um, also, you know, in the university setting, how can we do things like build networks across all of these disparate elements uh, that would include um, uh, academics doing sponsored research. Uh, we have students requiring hands-on or desiring really hands-on multidisciplinary project-based experiences. Uh, we have a need to engage the community in scientific uh, observation and uh, disseminate our work through academic publication and also transform curriculum with new ideas and how does curriculum in the classroom become informed by current research and how does it help facilitate student project-based learning. And so in this talk, I'll be telling you a bit about the weather chime system and how this model has really become a platform to help bridge all of these disparate elements together. So we thought it would be really neat to create a environmental sensor station that helped us kind of address these issues I just explained, uh, that it would need to be internet connected. We would work on connecting it to an online database that would enable researchers and scientists to access this data anywhere in the world with an internet connection in real time. Uh, but also, we sort of wanted to go a step beyond that. So usually these projects end at, we got the data to the scientists, yay. Um, but another really fun thing is like, how do you engage the community? How do you create engaging learning resources? And so we thought, uh, some musical and artistic applications of this device could be uh, a really fun way to introduce people into uh, environmental sensing and looking at data. Um, also, you know, to help us explore this vertically integrated project model, and I didn't invent the, the word. Um, this phrase is taken from a Georgia Tech uh, kind of concept that's been well established uh, through some of their VIP programs, um, but uh, we've sort of adapted it uniquely to OSU scope of, of going about our business. And so the VIP model is that integration of research, curriculum, multidisciplinary projects, client engagements, and academic publications. So creating these pipelines that connect all of them together. Uh, so what we did, and th this is a picture of our initial prototype, and I'll show you later in the presentation what we came up with as a, the next iteration. Um, we, connect, we created this uh, internet Wi-Fi based system where we had this uh, GS3, which measures soil moisture, uh, soil temperature, and electrical connectivity. 
the we have a this other blue chip here that measures solar radiation, which is a UV full spectrum and uh, infrared, and then um, right UV visible and infrared, and then you can infer um, the other stuff, and then uh, we got um, SHD thirty, which is a temperature humidity sensor. And we later added a uh, water depth as well. And I didn't have time to integrate that picture of that particular sensor into this, um, but maybe we'll see it, some of the other pictures here. Uh, why this combination of sensors? Well, um, another really fun thing that might be handy to do with you know temperature, humidity, solar radiation, soil moisture is we might be able to uh, figure out uh, evapotranspiration uh, through that as well. There's some you know, Pim and Monteith and fun things floating around out there that, you know, by synthesizing a variety of sensor inputs, you can kind of infer, come up with a, a number of different metrics. Um, and so this is kind of a system diagram of, of our design. So we have our sensors connected to this microprocessor. It's a, the brains, the system, the M0, Feather M0. Uh, and then it sends the data um, into this uh, well, and samples all the data and sends it into this like Mongo UV database through uh, MPTT broker, another script via Node-RED, and finally gets to uh, MongoDB, which is plotted and visualized and can be downloaded for later use as well. Um, so the research applications like you know, in situ environmental sensor data, the uh, being able to get that data online is really fun and valuable. So those applications are clear, but why music? But why sound? That sounds a little like extra and maybe unnecessary. Uh, well, let's take a listen to this here. And I wonder if... Uh, And you don't have to uh, pay attention to the graphics. I don't know why they put psychedelic visuals to this, but just kind of listen. Yeah, should be sharing online as well now. Give that a listen. identify what that is? Well, it's not a weather chime. It's a, wind, it's a wind chime, right? What is what is a wind chime do? Yeah? Okay. And in what ways might a wind chime be informative? Someone other than John. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other people? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. That's a, that's really fun. It, what if you like kind of knew the direction of like if the chime wasn't flopping around in the wind, but the chimes were, the times were always in the same place. Like, what what could you maybe discern a little bit? Maybe wind direction. Yeah, maybe like if the wind isn't blowing too hard. That it's ricocheting off of everything. Um, so that, that could be possible, maybe. Uh, so, yeah, so wind chimes, you could be sitting inside of your own living room and a chime could be hanging out outside your own door. Yeah. It is giving you really interesting information. Like it is creating an aesthetically pleasing, yet informative translation of an unseen environmental phenomenon happening right outside your window. 
right? And so we were we were like, well, could we do this for other things, other environmental uh, sensors? And I'm gonna just back up here. All right. So the notion of like translating data into sound is called sonification. And we might wonder like, why is sonification handy and under what circumstances? Uh, so imagine you're in a hospital room and anybody have, have the unfortunate experience of needing to, you know, be in a hospital and, you know, hear various sounds, right? So um, what do you think those, those sounds might be communicating? Right, okay. So, you know, thinking of the soundscape of a hospital, um, you, know, you hear like pulse, maybe heartbeats, uh, you hear other machines whirring and, you know, air compressors and things like that. And so uh, are those like arbitrary? Maybe some noises are, but a lot of uh, a lot of people design these things like to communicate very important information. Uh, why would uh, using a modality of hearing be uh, more useful in some contexts than a visual modality? Okay, uh, yeah, so it can maybe pull your attention to a very particular thing. Okay, what else? Okay, if you're blind, all right. Under what circumstances? What's that? Multidimensional. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. Right, so sound is omnidirectional, right? So you can hear the data um, behind, from behind you or even from around the corner in another room. You know, if you're a hospital attendant taking care of someone in one room, you may really want to know if uh, you hear someone flatlining in the room next door, right? So um, there's, so yeah, there's really interesting things that can happen when you translate data into sound. Um, some common ones that are used are the Geiger counter. That's a the radiation thing that uh, I didn't have an opportunity to put that sound sample in there, but it makes these clicks, and the higher the radiation, the thing is the uh, the devices add, the more dense and loud the clicks become. Um, and another thing might be like the seismograph where, you know, some people enjoy taking the visual of a seismograph and re sonifying that into an actual audible signal so that you can experience it through some other sensation, the modality of that quake. Um, so some of the experiences that I've had with the Weather chimes sonifying these things. Uh, students have shared that experiencing the data unfold in a time domain fashion has really gotten them to appreciate sort of the origins of the environmental sensor data itself. That means that um, when we take environmental data and we look at a time series, we tend to analyze that time series like out of time. When you are experiencing that data through a modality like sound, which is time-based, you're really put into a framework where the data is unfolding over time, just as it were unfolding sort of back when it was initially collected. You know, so a lot of the time series data we take is in fact, you know, time-based. And uh, students have shared that uh, by looking at this data through that time-based modality, it really got them to hone in and focus on certain features and phenomenon as things were happening, especially when you overlap maybe several data streams, maybe temperature and humidity and solar radiation. And by listening and seeing sample by sample, these things play back, uh, you begin to uh, become more acutely aware of relationships of how one might movement in one might precede the motion in another. So, um, okay, let's see. So, um, I was attempting to fill out a timeline and I ran out of time to make the presentation content. So that was, I think, a little ironic. 
So um, <laughs> to start, this really actually started way back in the day as a design for social impact pilot. So there were three, uh, it was called Engineering Design Society students. And we were initially making this for an LA based artist um, to come up with this, like this grant proposal for the LA um, Museum of Art. And we were going to do some kind of art and science installation on that. And so, um, it, and also we had a couple of URSA engaged students. And the achievement we, we had with that was we got this MongoDB database functionality kind of fleshed out. It also helped pay for us to experiment with some other databases. And so we explored, uh, there was, um, there's a few other databases that um, we initially tried, a few other protocols that we tried as well. And so this was actually maybe the third or fourth thing we actually attempted that was successful. Um, we also managed to get some preliminary sensors to work and we're able to validate the Wi-Fi connectivity. And as you can imagine, that works if you're gonna install these things on campus or near your home but it doesn't help you if you're like out in the field, right? Uh, many places we want to measure don't have a Wi-Fi connection, but it, it, as a proof of concept, it really helps. Um, I then put this into an honors college colloquium. And so this is where that vertically integrated project model starts to emerge. So uh, the honors college enables people to pitch to teach a colloquia on basically whatever topic you want. And so I was like, it would be really fun to teach a class on data sonification where my students will kind of take this holistic approach to environmental data science, kind of like a farm to table situation. So I, I feel, I mean, I, I'm not a data scientist myself. I'm more of a, like my, my degree is in music I if working in BEE, like I feel like sort of an outsider looking in on a lot of these like weird and strange processes of what it's like to be an environmental scientist. And one of the things I noticed was, um, you know, we're sort of like uh, many scientists are disconnected from the experience of the field. Like they uh, very often data scientists just work on big data sets and like they're collected from satellites, but they've never like been to the place or um, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of scientists who like field research is their bread and butter, um, but I also think there's a really big facet of data science that's just, you know, show me data, let's crunch numbers and see what we come up with. And so one of the practices I wanted to instill with the students that I think is very aligned with, you know, the BEE department, so there are a lot of field folks there, um, is this farm to table mentality with data. Um, I think from my experience, kind of just like learning a lot of the stuff as I go along directing the lab is that um, sensors tend to um, report the thing that they're designed to report, but not often within the context you think or hope um, they were supposed to report the stuff in. So um, this is this has become really fun because as I work with my honors college students, and I also work to do these workshops. Uh, uh, using the weather chimes at other places I'll talk about a bit, like at Sitka, Alaska, with high schoolers, undergrads, community members. Um, a lot of people like look at the data initially and they're like, well, yeah, that's the temperature or that's the soil moisture. Um, but then we put the sensors into the environment and like the act of like digging the hole and like putting that soil moisture sensor in there. And the uh, concept that, you know, you can't, pack the whole the dirt back into that hole too tight because you'll squeeze the moisture out or you can't pack it too loose because you'll create preferential flow. Um, like it, there's a bit of an art to like um, almost like you're farming or something like there's a bit of an art to installing this instrument just right. Um, and that that's pretty cool. Also like the idea that you could put a temperature sensor um, you know, three inches away into the shade versus in direct sunlight versus inside of a, a wind, just inside the window versus just inside of, outside a window or something is like, um, that can really create huge variations in how that sensor behaves. 
So um, I think a lot of these experiences for me, what made you know Weather Chimes as a learning platform so exciting um, is that you know this actually gets students out in the field, hands on the sensors, and you get to have those field experiences with the students. Uh, that way, when they look at the data, they have a real life association with like how that sensor was placed, and maybe if the sensor is behaving strangely, they may have an impression on like what they might do differently in, in the next field deployment to like help help that out, right? Um, so that was that was really fun. So anyways, you know, by doing this in an honors college co uh, colloquium, I happened to develop uh, 10 weeks worth of curriculum activities and, you know, all kinds of really fun stuff. Um, the, we came out with student projects and we also got a lot of really invaluable feedback for the next iteration of the device, which was actually really timely uh, because uh, the Opens Lab uh, had partnered with uh, a, a great number of universities. Like for the COPE grant, how many universities are on there? It's about five universities. And uh, it, it uh, basically the mission of the grant within our scope is to work with uh, Alaskan native coastal communities on uh, environmental monitoring. And uh, this is conducting workshops, it's making partnerships, and uh, basically uh, is a multi phase, it's a five year initiative and multiple phases. And this first phase, I really appreciated because um, a lot of, uh, you know, my initial approach was like, well, this is great. I already have activities I did in my honors college class. Let's go in gun, guns blazing and just show them how to do the stuff. And um, I really appreciated some of the, um, the feedback from the group at large was like, well, actually, um, you know, it, you don't know what the needs are. Um, you know, it, what something really interesting about, you know, native communities is that there's a um, acute awareness about you know environmental properties because their vocations depend on it, their traditional observation observations depend on it, um, and so uh, and and there's just a rich oral history of of um, uh, of how the climate and environment has evolved over time that um, goes way back before we've ever you know Western civilization have recorded. Uh, things, but you know the oral traditions are really important, and and plus, you know, many native communities have been very diligent in science efforts and data collection efforts, and so um, that's a it's a huge deal. So uh, this first year was basically about learning and conducting a few preliminary exercises with uh, our community members, and basically just kind of bouncing things off the feedback and seeing what we might do here in future years. So um, towards that, we moved our students um, off of the, uh, the DSI funding, the URSA uh, money was only a temporary thing that right now. So we're supporting, must've been like five students at one point building 14 weather chimes on the NSF grant. And um, they updated the internet to make use of 4G connection. And uh, that was, um, yeah, and, and it turned out to be super cool. Oh, they also added the uh, water depth and water temperature sensor as well. Um, mainly because uh, when you think of coastal communities, especially native coastal communities, um, one of the things I learned in our seminars leading up to our workshops was, uh, fish runs and fish spawning is an incredibly important um, aspect of daily life. And so uh, a major predictor of that is stream temperature. And so we, uh, that was a very uh, critical thing we, we needed to put into that system before we went up to up. So uh, Wellfest happens in November, 2022. We traveled to the Sitka Sound Science Center, a uh, very cool host. Uh, it had an apartment they put me up in, which was really fantastic. We worked with 20 high schoolers, about 20 undergrads, six community members, 
And um, we basically work through a variety of exercises uh, that uh, I will be delighted to show you here because uh, I'm going to run out of content. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it was really, I would love to share a story about the undergrads. So the undergrads flight was delayed. They didn't get in until two in the morning and their workshop was 8 a.m. I asked them the question, first thing in the workshop, well, uh, why were you here? Why did you sign up for it? And they were like, the necropsy uh, of a dead sea lion was um, already full. And so uh, I knew I had my the deck stacked against me there. And uh, after working through the exercises and, and stuff, they, uh, they were just absolutely electrified and um, very enthusiastic. They, were, they told you know, the, all their friends that how much they enjoyed it. And uh, I, it, it, it just ended up being a really great uh, success story, like sna snatched out of the jaws of defeat. Um, so uh, before I move into the vertically integrated project model, I think it would be timely to maybe share some photos of the experience. So this was the new and improved um, weather chimes. It has a solar panel. The blue thing in here is a battery. The light sensor is in there. There's a temperature and humidity sensor. You see it installed under the eaves of the um, the canopy, you can see though that it does get direct sunlight. So, you know, that temperature data, you know, can be a little skewed. Um, it is facing the south side of the building to maximize the um, sunlight, which in, you know, November is not great. Uh, this picture here, the volumetric cylinder that you see, uh, graduated cylinder, um, is it's got our water depth and water temperature, and we we were using it as a rain gauge, uh, rain collector. So, um, but if we were near convenient to a stream, we would have put it there. Um, it also had a way off around the corner uh, soil moisture uh, sensor as well. Um, you know, this is us, uh, and you know my very warm coffee, which was appreciated. Uh, during the during the really cold times and yeah there's our students right here showing them the installation process um in the classroom we did all kinds of fun activities like so uh this was a um an activity where we had them calibrate the water sensors in the lab first uh, so that they could see how validation is a very important aspect of you know, homebrewed sensors. Uh, and then let's see. Um, yeah, so I think what I'll do is I've, I've chatted up this whole data sonification and visualization thing quite a bit. So what I might do is um, let me start with a very basic example. Uh, let's go to weather chimes, activities, and let's go to sonification basics. And I'm just going to connect to the database here. And I'm going to work kind of fast because I know I'm like towards the end of time. So what I just did is I told my system to log on to MongoDB using the following credentials and retrieve the last 288 samples, which um, this takes data uh, in 96 samples a day. So uh, I have, you know, and then you can basically choose from here uh, the different kinds of sensors that uh, were logged. And so uh, something like this, you might, to translate that into sound, I was going to go ahead and... All right, so um, and the y axis is uh, in Celsius here, and the y axis has the temperatures that were selected. And, you know, that's kind of fun, but it's not like, you know, in nothing to write home about. Um, this is another example where uh, we can change things like pitch. Another aspect of sound you can change is timbre. So this is temperature, that same temperature graph. But now I'm pitch is staying the same, but the timbre, which is the complexity of the tone, is changing. So
So our ears are actually capable of hearing multiple channels of information simultaneously. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a temperature graph and the soil moisture graph uh, at the same time. And I want you, uh, the temperature graph is going to modulate the frequency and the soil moisture is going to modulate the timbre, the, the complexity of that tone. And I want you to see if you can hear the two different streams of information simultaneously. I'll do, uh, I'll, instead I'll choose humidity. So here you can kind of hear the lower the temperature, the higher the humidity, the more complex that tone is. And then the higher the temperature, the less humidity there is, so the less complex that tone is. All right, and um, for our activities, what we did was, uh, you know, that that's really fun, but like, can you make it musical? And so, uh, yeah, we can. So I'm just going to connect to the same client. I'm going to set my speed, my metronome to 200 milliseconds. I'm going to um, queue up, let's say, Let's do 288, three days worth of three days worth of data here, like we did last time. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit play and turn up the volume. So what's going on here is you know, as the data stream down and up, it's moving up the curve along the piano keyboard and playing a note on that scale uh, based on where and here's what uh, humidity sounds like when you turn that up. And I'm just going to choose a little visual here. Uh, this visual is um, actually uh, the touch sink at the Sickness Out Science Center. There's a, a starfish chilling out in there. And uh, I did solar radiation. And the higher the solar radiation is, the redder the image will be. And so you might like take a look and see, like, you know, when the solar radiation peaks, listen to see if there's any response. cycle of the day and uh, move on to my, I guess, between the marks and sources. All right. So, um, yeah, you can make this stuff sound like music, which is like super fun. I just want to like maybe summarize um, uh, this vertically integrated project model, then move on with like the future directions real fast. So I want to give you a bird's eye view of what happened here. So this is a, like our open class students. It started out as like the DS514 team um, and now it's like completely NSF funded through the open class. Uh, and you know these students were just absolutely uh, tenacious and critical at you know basically championing the design of these things. Uh, so they design, they produce the technology, they support our clients, they provide uh, oversight, mentorship, and continuity as students cycle out through these experiences. Uh, they're also, uh, uh, we just received word, we got an open access publication in Hardware X uh, yesterday um, on the weather charts, so that was fun. Um, this team interfaces with our multidisciplinary capstone team. I have like right now a four computer science majors working on different applications uh, for sonification, visualization, 
I'm also this term keeping up uh, that honors college colloquium yet again. And so this capstone team is actually also working with that class as like a tech support, which is kind of fun. Um, and then, you know, again, the mission, the, the National Science Foundation funding or just like research funding in general. And so faculty research, how they can support these kinds of things. And then um, students interfacing with, you know, our project clients in this case, the Sitka Sound Science Center, uh, NSF, and our other university partners on the uh, uh, COPE uh, CUTE grants. So special, special thanks to my, my students. Um, oh, and I, these were, I was supposed to zoom in on those things. I was talking about them. So there you go. Yay. And um, so basically uh, where we're going, um, this is, uh, we're sending two in the mail right now to Sitka High School for use in a, the traditional ecological knowledge course. Um, we're also planning to send a few to Huna High School for their river monitoring program and hopefully going to be taking a little tour, maybe with some students uh, to go around uh, places like Huna and Sitka to um, conduct more workshops. We got a lot of feedback from uh, members of the Alaska community that you know we're looking for dust for like air quality monitoring, so wood burning stuff and like um, you know uh, personal air quality is kind of a, a big deal there. Uh, rain. They also think rain gauges are you know really valuable. Um, there's uh, some of our friends at University of Oregon are looking at landslide hazards for these coastal communities, and uh, they have determined as of right now that. Uh, massive rainfall events are the leading predictors of landslide, not necessarily what we initially thought was the uh, uh, soil saturation and stuff. So they, they think like, or from what I gathered from talking with them, that massive rainfall events are actually more accurate at predicting uh, possible landslide hazards. So, um, and yeah, we're, we're just trying to create a better robust design and better, better educational app. So, uh, thanks for uh, bearing with me. <laughs> thanks. Oh, yeah, it looks like share your screen on Zoom. No screen share. Oh, okay. <laughs> actually um, you know this is sometimes when we say multidisciplinary we often bring a single engineering perspective and kind of split the different aspects of how we can be great in music is really amazing and so I think from my my way of experience sometimes when NASA sent out their data from black hole merging to black hole merging all the things in the Mars they often use this sounds to create that graph and I think for the layman to understand what exactly that sounds like they want resonating than sometimes it's looking at a black hole. This is how black hole works. So this is really, really exciting to see how the situation is completely up to date. Thank you. That's fun. Yeah. That was nice to see that. Thanks. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, it depends. Uh, that's what a good engineer will tell you. <laughs> um, but like they, it, they're on a solar panel. So it really depends on how many hours of daylight they get. Um, we determine that if these things get about like, you know, three hours of daylight or more, they should run um, and they should charge faster than they're depleting. Um, now in real life, is that the case? Uh, that's not what I've experienced in Alaska. Um, one of the reasons might be because it's freezing cold up there <laughs> right now and batteries, um, don't do well, uh, they, their capacity greatly decreases in cold weather. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I, I also want to say thanks to John for your enthusiasm. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk to the group. And um, it's, always, it's always a pleasure to present what the students in the lab have been working on these days. Yeah,
this program was going so you know, somebody wants to in the way we in the year we said as we do we have all these programs before coming back in school what would you what would you do with that so more of the yeah, so this web uh, or this um, application here that pulls data off the web is specifically designed to um, log into like a MongoDB type of database. And so it's yet to be explored if we can upload uh, data sets uh, from third party types of things, but I believe we could as long as it's uh, you know formatted in a way that MongoDB will, will accept and it accepts a, a large number of formats. We think we might be able to connect uh, even non real time data sets that you just you know upload in bulk into the system. So that could be really, yeah, I, I would be delighted to explore that people. All right, thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yes, sir. There we go. Uh,